Security identity management comes in all shapes and sizes, and it's an industry that continues to innovate at a rapid pace. There's no one in sight. Think of identity management like this. That card or fob you scan to enter an office or building, that's security management. Or maybe the password you change every 30 days, that's identity management. But while these processes seem simple and familiar, they really haven't been part of the security ecosystem for very long. 15 years ago, phones were different. We didn't know about online identities. We didn't have digital passports. We were using batches to access buildings. If you fast forward the pace at what we are changing is pretty traumatic and fast. Traumatic and fast are strong but appropriate words when describing the pace at which Martin Ladstetter and HID Global are working at when it comes to making it easier for consumers to access their everyday necessities. On this episode of IT Visionaries, Martin, the head of consumer authentication and VP of product management at HID Global, explains how the company is digitizing this new world and securing consumers across multiple networks. Martin also dives into the struggles enterprises are facing when it comes to securing distributed workforces and what the future of access identity management holds. IT Visionaries is created by the team at Mission.org and brought to you by Salesforce Platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Innovate fast, empower every employee, and scale with confidence from anywhere with a customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com slash platform. Welcome everyone to another episode of IT Visionaries and today, we have the VP of Product Management at HID Global, Martin Ladstetter. Welcome to the show. Hey, Albert. How are you doing? Yeah, great having you. And right out the gate, HID Global is a huge company, but I don't know if anyone even knows who you guys are at a consumer level. I'm sure enterprises, of course, know who you are. But why don't you tell our audience exactly what is HID Global and what is your principal responsibility at the company? Sure. Happy to do so. From an HD point of view, we're basically in the security space. And it's all about digitizing the new age, if you want to take it like that. We came from a security background. Most of you would possibly know us in those black readers on the wall who give you access and the cards that you swipe in front of your doors, like that's HD Global. You see that in a lot of TV series and everything, but that's just one piece of it. There is, in theory, six groups, divisions, business areas, if you want to call it like that. And our mission is really to protect people, places, and things. It's all about security um, and making the life easier for everyone. So a lot of things you'd see today, possibly, and you use day in, day out, are actually from us. So people who are here sitting here and have a green card, we are building them, right? We're making them. People of you who run a passport, we might have done them for you. People of you who work at a company and swipe batches at doors or use their phones to access those buildings, that technology typically comes from us people who have access control to their physical space or the digital assets like your phones or your PCs and how we protect those. That's another thing that we do. And then there is other things like, you know, protecting your machinery and production and things like that. But we could talk about that later. It's, it's about making sure that the people who work in some places and the things that they carry along are all secured. That's what we are about. Super fascinating marketplace. And like you already said, most of us have used one of your products, probably unknowingly, but we've u- we're using your products today. I mean, even on your website, it lists out you know appliances, biometric readers, cards, credentials, controllers. So if you swipe anything, if, if you swipe something to gain access to another thing, HID might be playing a part. Is that a great way to explain it? Yeah, it depends on what you do, but I would agree. Like a bank transaction, like getting access to a building or um, getting access to a country, checking if your pet that is your beloved one actually is tagged correctly. Anything from any machine to anything to any person, it's all about identities and how to protect them at the end of the day. Yeah. And then, you know, talk a little bit about how this space is evolving because on one hand, access management has always been around, right? And so talk about some of the cutting edge innovations that are coming or that you, you've seen evolve. Because, you know, for some, it's like, oh, it's a sensor and it's a, you know, it's an object. It, you know, the sensors get smaller, the object readers get more accurate. It's not really, you know, we as a people always tend to oversimplify things. I remember, you know, Y Combinator legendarily, or when people apply to 
builds great startups like Dropbox, like it's just a USB drive. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> people tend to oversimplify things. They don't recognize the complexity to make something simple. So I'd love to talk you to talk a little bit about how this technology is changing and what's really being unlocked in regards to like the use cases of having whether it's more portable, more durable, more resistant. I, I don't know exactly what are the big, a bull, we call them the bulls, like the durable, you know, what are the big things that you guys are pushing down the path towards and what's that unlocking? So I think the very easiest way to look at that, and it's a common theme across everything, is like what used to be a complex manual and physical thing before is becoming a seamless and kind of digital right now. I would say that you can apply to pretty much every concept and every product, every new innovation that is there right now. I'll give you a few examples. Like, of course, from a historical point of view where most of people know us, you go into a door, you use the batch or some people unlocked a building, right? By a key, right? Mm -hmm. So today you have your phone, you take the phone, you have a digital credential on it, right? And you basically use that for several things. You could get into a building. You could also pay at Starbucks, right? You could use it to identify yourself for any online transaction. But the other way to look at this is a more consumer-oriented side of the house is like you take your bank and in the past you, you went to the bank, took your money, deposited it. Today, you look at your online statements, you take a swipe and you make a transaction. The stuff that's behind all of that, that secures all of your assets, whether it's getting access to a building, getting access to your bank account, is kind of what's digitized over the past. And now that, meanwhile, is something that a lot of people are doing. But now how to do the smart, what I call how to do it that is invisible, right? For you that you kind of just have user experience that's like, oh, I didn't even notice it was there, but you could take good care of me. I think that's what this all is about and where all of the efforts are going through. So if you don't see what's happening, it's actually great because that means we've done our job pretty well. Now, when for yourself, are you sitting more on the, because there's all, usually for these things, there's a, there's all software components. Sometimes there's, there's usually typically some type of hardware component. Of course, something has to be able to scan and read whatever it is you're swiping. Yeah. Do you sit in both realms or are you more focused on software or hardware for at HID? So I'm, I'm what's called the identity and access management space, which is literally the software group of the house that it's not just software. We have hardware as well. Mm -hmm. But I think when we look about where all of the things come together, it typically is the second piece of what you asked before is what's the journey? It's more from point products of how people use things as solutions and how, how to bring things together, right? It's like, so rather than, oh, I have this, I can use it for that. And then I'll pick something else. It's like, I like the Apple concept. It's like everything out of one pocket, right? You know what you get. You have an ecosystem. You feel comfortable with that. You know how it works. And then there are some pieces that bring it together, right? Mm -hmm. Which is like, oh, I might have something that's giving me access to my building. It's something that gives me access to my PC. I have something that allows me to transact securely. I know where my people are as long as they're in the company. I can access sick data securely and I'll take care of all of what's happening in the back kind of that conceptually is what brings a lot of those things together from a software point of view. And to me, that's one of the most exciting spaces because it's dynamic, it's fast, it's happening. You at the vibe of what's going on and people really love to see what's going on. So I think that that's kind of uh, something that's really fun and driving. Yeah. I'd love to hear some of the projects potentially that you're working on or some of the things that you just recently, let's say, shipped into public marketplace, some of the things that are changing in regards to this access, because from someone who's knowledgeable on the topic, you might say like, oh, you know, swiping to access something, that seems pretty simple. Showing a QR code or whatever the object is on my phone to access something, that seems pretty simple. Yeah. How much more innovation can there be in this space? I know there's, there's probably tons, because I'm now imagining like, actually, I'm going to save this part for the end, because I want to ask you if this is even possible, because this is what I'm dreaming of. But I'd love to hear some of the innovations you guys are, uh, you know, recently launched or launching soon and kind of for our audience to understand, like, you know, access, this is what great, I would call it a passive experience. Like you said, like non-noticeable passive, like you don't have to actively do something. You don't even notice it's there. What can it un really unlock? So take a few concepts. If you work at the company, it's like you go to your PC or you go to a station, or if you're a doctor and you move from room to room in a hospital to inspect people, you log into your PC 
you know, typically you have a password or you swipe a badge. What are conceptual things that exist today and that make life easier? It's like, oh, you carry your phone and your phone is your key to your PC as well. As soon as you approach your PC, right, it knows it's like Bluetooth connected. It unlocks seamlessly. One concept that works nicely. The second thing, possibly more for the end users, is like, think about your bank account. There's always, in today's time, there's always like, how do I make sure that I'm protected against fraud, right? How do I make sure my money is secure, right? In the past, people used, again, passwords, right? Then they had like, oh, you get an SMS and then you type in that code. And then, you know, it's kind of something where a lot of attacks happen in today's world, right? So what's happening, what I call the invisible part is, meanwhile, there's a lot of artificial intelligence that runs in the back that knows what you have been doing and is able to figure out, oh, is that actually Martin who was here the last time logging in from a Samsung phone from that country with something like that time frame? And is he doing it in a certain way? And is he showing some behavioral artifacts? That gives me confidence level that that actually is Martin again, right? Rather than, okay, somebody from a total different country at a different place at an awkward time. So they would say, oh, that's strange. Let's check again, right? Those things is what I call from a conceptual piece. It's like either you have something that makes your life easier that you carry along, or you do something in the background that basically enhances the security that people don't even know that it's there and exists. The last piece I want to give you is think of something. It's like if you're a company and you have high value assets in there with data, um, like a law firm or um, any data you want to protect. A lot of the times, like say um, fraud or basically attacks happen by using accounts of people, by socially engineering those people and then getting into the weeds of it, right? But let's say if, if you have a control in place saying, oh, whatever, Albert never entered the building, right? Why would he want access to the PC in the building if I know he never entered it, right? Or that's a really strange time that he's there. Why would he be there at 3 a.m. in a different location? You could run analytics on all of those things. It's like what a lot of Google and Facebook does, trying to figure out your behavior. It's like what can be done to enhance security in a corporate environment, in governments, in enterprises, in banks, in airports, whatever you want to think about. No, that's awesome because... We hear all the time of people always wanting to up security. And then we also are aware now of like, there's a new, it's come up a couple different times on a couple different guests, how the new security threat, it was easy to secure things when we all worked together in the office. They said it was a lot easier now, uh, a lot easier then, but now we got distributed workforce. So like, that means I have a company device that can get to the company VPN. I obviously don't need a swipe to get into my own house. You know, now you have to develop new controls, like how do you access the computer? How do you log in? How do you prevent someone who has gotten up? Like this was postulated by one of our guests. If I have, let's say I work for a bank financial company, I'm sitting here on my computer typing, but I get up to use the bathroom. How do you know someone else hasn't now just using my computer? And they're, they're talking about all these new access challenges that are going to come up yeah. due to hybrid work environments. I agree. So. A lot of problems actually arise by the user. Yeah. Let's be honest about it. <laughs> We're still the weakest link. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And that's, it's the number one point of attack, typically, uh, if you're very honest about it, because somebody doing something in a big mass of employees that's wrong, not even intentionally, is typically the, the area that people find a way to do something, right? Yeah. So I, I think from what you just explained, like you go up and go to a bathroom, is like, okay, if you never locked it, if there is no timer, if you left your phone as well, and that was your key to lock yourself in and all of that, it's still the user. You can't prevent it because nobody will stop you. There's technology like you could check with a camera if somebody's in front of your PC, but like it's complicated on some pieces, right? You might never know. And Yeah, it can get invasive. You lost the privacy that happens. Exactly. So you also don't want to monitor all of your employees all day long about everything that they do, right? So <laughs> I think you just need to find the right balance of checking in and protecting the assets for what's valuable. So what I always say is like, if somebody gets access to a PC, it actually not really something's broken at that point in time, right? It's like, just protect what you want to protect with a certain level of degree that you need to think about it, right? And I think that that's kind of a concept that 
people should look into and um, keep in their mind. So the higher you get in the security, the more obstacles you might want to put in place, right? Talk a little bit about, you know, I don't disagree. I think this is all really super fascinating stuff. And then when I also think about is the next evolution, in my opinion, is how to handle things that get damaged. So I'd love for you to hear your perspective on this, because one of the things that we become overly reliant, in my opinion, on the cell phone. So like a nefarious thing is my cell phone is taken, right? Yeah. But a more common likely scenario is I drop my phone. You know, if, if all of our detail is in our device, access to everything, yeah. but I drop it. Like I can tell you right now, one of my sensors doesn't work because I have kids and they basically, <laughs> and I let them use my phone. They've dropped it enough times. You know, one of my sensors on the phone doesn't work. We've all know somebody or ourselves who has cracked a screen and all of a sudden none of the codes and nothing can scan. You know about that as well. How do you handle, you know, if we put so much security or reliance on a single break point, yeah. how do you protect against like common problems? Like that, I would consider that a common problem. I dropped my phone. Like it's, it didn't work right now. Absolutely. <laughs> so again, it depends obviously as of what you put on your phone as the first question is <laughs> of how complex or easy a recovery is going to be. Let, let's start with something really easy on a personal level. Forget about enterprises. So if me personally, I'm, I'm an Android and Google guy. So if my phone goes bust, well, I have a recovery. I play it back in and everything's there because everything's stored already. Yeah. Now that doesn't work for everyone in an enterprise, but it does work the same way. For example, if on our side, if my PC drops or my phone drops, I basically can restore what it was before by just having kind of the templates there. Now, that's not helpful when you have like 25 different logins and everything's on your <laughs> phone and everything is there, which is the typical problem that we all are battling with. Like, yeah. oh, damn, I don't remember what was my login for that particular site. Yeah. And then, you know, my VPN and then my password that changes on a 30-day notice every time. It's like, how do I keep track of that? I think now it comes very much down to the enterprise of how they're handling things. And that's also one thing where a lot of people over the pandemic particularly got way smarter than they used to be in the past, right? <laughs> so it's just, they had to put everyone in home office and all of a sudden a company who had like 500 employees in one place with two IT people or three <laughs> now has 500 people in 500 places. And, you know, if I don't sort out that problem, how do I do this well, then it becomes a hassle, obviously. So, you know, the typical concepts are self-service portals where basically it stores your data, but it can, you, you can reset yourself basically and enroll yourself, which goes to one concept of really, it's managing the life cycles of identities. Using a phone, losing a phone, getting a new phone, getting a new PC is just in every day's life, right? It's, it's yeah. in all of us. Enrolling a new identity or transferring a new identity is the concept that every solution, every application, everything that's corporate ready kind of needs to have today. And in order to unravel the burden from like a company or from a bank or a doctor or a whatever a hospital or an airport, you try to make that as autonomous as you can, right? So the user gets one kind of link, one kind of starting point, and from there, you can do it yourself. Not the very first time, obviously, when you join a new company, they will take it for you. That they will get it done for you. But after that, basically, so if I, for example, lose my phone, I can reset the things. I can enroll myself again. I could add another phone. I could deprovision my phone. Like those kind of things are things you can do. You just need some access to the web somewhere, right? No, I, I agree. And that's on the software side. So let, I want to take the conversation over to the physical realm. Okay. Because one of the things I'm curious about also is, you know, you mentioned corporations quite a bit and industrial applications. Do you see HID Global Solutions or your technologies making its way into consumer facing products? Because this is where I was hinting at before. I want to talk to you about how we access our cars. For those on the <laughs> listening, I'm holding up three things. A fob, the common key you see now, which is uh, it's not only the physical key with the cuts and the teeth, but also, of course, secure uh, microchip buttons so that I can open my door. And of course, this is the new thing that, of course, people can get access their cars with is like they, you can just do it with your phone. That's true there. And then there's also the keyless fob entries, 
And what I'm curious about is, and then this is the reason why I'm curious about number one is HID going to be bringing more consumer applications in. And then I want to talk a little bit about elemental problems, uh, because I actually have a fundamental reason why these things actually don't work for most consumers. Well, not most consumers, outdoors people, I would say <laughs> for sure. They don't work for outdoors people, but we'll dive into that in just a second. Is HID going into consumer applications? Well, the quick answer is yes, but you need to be specific about what, right? Okay. So we have, for example, one of the other things I'm doing is I'm, I'm responsible for a business unit that's actually called consumer authentication. <laughs> it's just, it's a funny <laughs> coincidence in that sense. So it's really protecting kind of the end users of our customers. Yeah. So conceptually, that's like, think about a healthcare organization their doctors or their patients. How can you get access to your patient portal? Or like you as a bank user, as I mentioned before, is like, how do I protect kind of my mobile app and how do I use that? What is my key towards my bank and how do I look at that, right? How do we enable that? That's one side. But then there's also, you ask how we involved in that not just from a software, but also on the physical side. So when you hold up a key, there's a very good likelihood that one of those, like say RFID fobs that authenticate you inside of like say a key, for example, could be from our identification technologies group inside of HID. And there's also, of course, you have the traditional physical access patches, which are the typical cards, like the credit card size cards that have your photo on it and stuff like that. So those things, obviously, we do any of those. But the other way to think of consumers is like, where does an identity get mobile on a government space? So there is like the rollout of digital driving license, digital personal identities, right? So if you look, for example, Argentina, we are doing the digital personal identity for every person in the country, basically, who wants it. And that's something that HID is working on, basically. So there's different aspects of where consumers basically hit our corporation. And then there's obviously us being integrated with a lot of other things, but those are the typical aspects where we would look about that. And then, as I mentioned at the very beginning, passports, obviously. Everyone who carries a passport at some point in time, possibly depending on what country, there's not just us, there's many others, but like say, if you or if you carry a green card, that will be us as well. This is my story of how, how good your technology is. So I once was in Brazil and I was carrying, I don't know why I did this, but I stored my passport in my swim fins because I was like, oh, no one will look there. And I forgot about it. And I actually went swimming with them. So I literally had my passport at the bottom of my foot swimming for, let's say, hours in the ocean. And when, I didn't even realize my passport was in my swim fin until I got out. And I was pretty convinced it wouldn't work because you know how when paper dries, it's kind of like layered. Yeah. So I, that was the first time I learned that there's actually like a sensor of some sort in there. Like when you scan it, is that right? There's like a sensor in there. Yeah. There's like an RFID chip in there that has, depending on what country and like data on it, like typically your name and the passport number at minimum. And then now it is fingerprints, for example, just to make the immigration and to go over the border easier so that you don't have to do it manually all the time. But yeah, that's stored in there. And yeah, I was, I was shocked because I thought for sure, because I was there for a week. I was like, oh man, it's going to rust or it's going to have problems. Like it's going to, this is not going to work. I'm not going to be not allowed in the country. And that's what started getting me talking about early in this conversation is when is RFI, not RFID, I don't even know what to call it, the swipe technology you, you, you mentioned before, the easy access for us to just swipe on. Yeah, it's, it's RFID, it's radio frequency identification. So it's the tags and the coils that are sitting inside of anything or on your phone, it's NFC basically, or Bluetooth as well. There are multiple technologies who make that happen. All right, when's it coming to a car so I don't even have to turn my key? I just, I just wave my card around my front and I turn it on. It's already there. It depends what car brand you're using. So some European brand, let's not be too specific about it. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the big German car manufacturers, if you take one of them, like there's different options you can order on cars today. It's like yeah. you showed the key. Well, that's one. You put your key inside of the lock and unlock your door. The next thing is obviously you have a smart key that has kind of an RFID tag inside that gets registered by a car. And when you insert yourself into the car, so I sit on the driver's seat, it will recognize there's a key and, you know, you can press the start stop button, which we all are used to. Yep. 
next evolution is obviously well and that's no news it's been there for quite a while it's like yep. having the same concept on the phone it's like your phone becomes your access key it's the same as if you get inside of a building it's there and it's also something that like other companies are dealing with like where they have wallets of identities where you bring things together right and where you then can use whatever I have a car key and I have my house key and I have my office key all together in a wallet, for example. It's what we do here very well as well from what we call mobile access. It's one of our six groups that we have inside of HID, so the physical access group in that particular. Mobile access is nothing else than a digital key for you, right? Which enables you to get into that, which is also very popular on like university campuses, for example. No one's using, like, university lifetime of a card is not very long, right? <laughs> so you gave a good example. People go swimming, people go and party, yeah. people lose it, they drop their wallet, I forgot it, my friend took it, right? What people never leave at home is their phone, right? <laughs> you, you turn around to get your phone if you forgot it, right? So that's always with you, so that's not a bad idea if that gives you access, for example. Well, listen, I appreciate that because now I'm thinking about what manufactured is because what I was getting at was I want to access my vehicle with a non-battery powered access point that I can take with me on the go, easily put in my pocket and be submerged in water because this key, so like this key with the buttons on the fob that you can't bring it with you because it's, it's battery powered. There's a little battery in it. Like you leave in the oceans, it's going to, it's going to die right? If it's the remote keyless fobs, same thing. You can't bring it with you in the ocean, but you also can't leave it in your car because then anyone can open the door and just take whatever they want, uh, as you know. So if you're telling me there's an RFID type product where I can access my car, but it can go with me and then with, and it's waterproof, I'm in it. That's what I need. Cause I was, I saw <laughs> like, for example, I was reading like the Tesla specs. I was like, man, this car is not for me. Like I would get my car stolen. <laughs> Because I'd always leave my phone or my fob in the car because I, I go to the water all the time. Yeah, of course. If you leave it in the car, then there is a problem, um, Albert. And, you know, uh, it always comes back to the users as we discussed, right? So the, the number one problem is the users. It might be you this time, but no. Um, yeah, but but I can't take it in the water. I got. <laughs> there's actually technology today that does allow to do you what it does. Again. If you take your car example, for example, my car has like a backup key that is pure plastic and literally is just a fob exactly for that thing. <laughs> you could carry it in your pocket and it doesn't matter and you could unlock your car. It, it's, it really depends. And car industry is, is doing their own thing a bit, but that stuff is already there. Yeah. I, I would say that that's no news to the industry anymore. I guess I need it on my brand, my preferred brand, because it's not there. <laughs> Before you got into this role, what were you thinking uh, in regards to like where you want to invest your time and energy? Because one of the things I always find fascinating is technologists, technology is everywhere, right? Very few of us end up doing what we thought we were going to do when we were, let's say, at university, right? <laughs> like, we're, unless, and maybe you were, maybe you back at university, you were like, man, I really want to be in the identity access space, but <laughs> I don't know. So talk about how your role as your like career and your has evolved since you know, from when you were studying technology as a young, young person. So yeah, the one thing that is true is that I've been a techie since the beginning. Yeah. So that's true. So I've done telecommunications and stuff like that. But at university, I had no idea that an Indian access management even existed, right? So <laughs> if you'd ask me back then, I remember one interview back when I, when I was interviewing for a job, like years and years and years and years back. And this guy told me, Oh, and there is this, we are doing RFID. And I'm like, okay, so what is that, right? <laughs> it was like, I had no idea back then. But so I, I literally, when I was back in university, my background was biotechnology, right? It was kind of coming from a, how do we protect things and machinery that deal with people in hospitals? And my other background is gaming. Mm -hmm. That was the two things that I was really big at when I was at university, right? So we've done a lot of that and the rest is just like, it just happened, right? You get into a role, you, you start to work through some acquisitions and then you change jobs around. At the end of the day, somewhere you land and then it evolves, right? And technology captures you and you kind of start liking it. And then you find your way through different industries and you, at some point you find something that you really and truly love. And to me, it's like, 
for me, as long as it's entertaining, it has a pace. You can show the passion that you're around and you like to change things that are like, I personally would be bored if things would be very stagnant, the same thing all day long. To me, it like there needs to be the next best thing that comes around and the next challenge that is there. And that needs to put you in front of a problem that, oh, how do we address that? It's like, you know, that's entertainment for me. And I, I think that's the good thing is like, you talked about at the very beginning, things change very rapidly. Like 15 years ago, phones were different. We didn't know about online identities. We didn't have digital passports. We were using batches to access buildings. Like if you fast forward the pace at what we are changing is pretty dramatic and fast. So I, I find that fascinating and that's super interesting in my mind. So that's what's for me in there, right? You know, we, we of course looked you up on LinkedIn. You know, you have a very consistent career in this identity space. So, you know, I had to ask if it was something you were interested in from the very beginning. Ah, it just came together like that. But yeah, it's like over the time, you know, there were a lot of different industries like embedded, banking, transportation, government, then banking again, and then really like the hardware side of the house. And now the software and particularly like, applications and software that deal with end users and B2B and then B2B2C. And like, to me, it's like driving the user experience for people who use it. That's what I find fascinating and doing that really in a way that makes people happy, right? I, I think that's what it's all about. You're the best example of this. You, you have something that you really want to do, right? Yeah. I would love to get this thing done, right? Like, <laughs> let's talk about how we solve that problem. That, that's a good challenge, right? And the more people you can address with what you're, what you have, and if you have the passion for it, I think then you can take a lot of people with you on the journey. And I think that's what this is about. And you know, listening to you explain some of the products and services that HID you're in charge of, you know, because I think the consumer experience is pretty understood. Like you mentioned before, it's got to be passive, it's got to be simple. Whether it's phone, it's got to have a backup system in case the screen breaks. Like there's all these things in place. But really, I would assume the majority of like where you can really make an impact is on the other side. Like if now I'm in charge of granting, administering the access to all my different access points, yeah. I need some type of software that lets me do that. How much time do you spend with those people on the other side that grant this access, that use your tools? You know what I mean? Because it's for me, you know, having a fob, I mean, my user experience is the same. No matter what fob I use, it's no problem. Like when I swipe it, it lets me in. Like you said, that technology has been around. So all the, I feel like the, a lot of the big jumps and revolutions and evolutions are occurring on the other side, which is whoever owns the gates. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think a lot, I can only speak to everyone who doesn't do it that way. You need to change. That's my first thing. <laughs> so what am I talking about? It's like the number one thing to listen out for is what do your customers say? Yeah. It's like, and it's not, it's on the one side, yes, the people who buy it, but they also have people that they need to make happy. It's the people who use it, right? Yeah. The people who are day in, day out, it needs to fulfill a purpose for the people who purchase, but it needs to be used by people who are happy about it because you could buy the cheapest product or whatever. That doesn't mean that your customers, like say the employees in the company, if it's really complicated to ever get access to anything, people would just not like it. They will try to avoid it, right? If it works beautiful and like, oh, that was great, right? You, you'd love it, right? Oh, you noticed I can go to the cafeteria. I didn't have to do anything and they just charged me on the way out, right? No problem, right? <laughs> uh, how did they do that? I don't care, but it just works, right? Great example of, of just like people would use it because it's just seamless. So you ask particularly, how do we talk to people? I think that's a very, very essential thing that a lot of people do wrong is like assuming you know what people want. I think it's wrong. My first starting point is, I know nothing. <laughs> Let people tell me what they want and then ask the questions of what does that mean? Like always go deeper. It's like, why do you need that? What problem are you addressing? Why is that an issue for you? Why would somebody use it that way? And so for me, it's a lot about focus groups, talking to the customers, helping them understand what their problem is, and then basically guiding them based on that story. We think, you know, you really have a problem with this, right? And you talked about how do you manage access control in things. It's, it's funny because one of these software items that we are really responsible for as well is like, for example, take what's called HD Safe, funny name on that, but it protects basically your assets as of 
how do you get access to what area? Like think about an airport for somebody to get access to a secure area, you need to have certification. You need to be trained. Yeah. You need to have made sure to run through an onboarding process. How do you make sure you track all of that? How do you connect 5,000 contractors and 800 employees all together? How do you manage all of that? It's a very complex scenario. So you need something that sits there and just has a handle where is everything? And then it needs to be auditable. So it's the same for governments. It's the same for banks. It's the same for big enterprises, right? At some point, you reach a complexity level where you just need to have something that takes care of it. And then on the other side, the even more complicated area is if you think about how do you protect access to the things that don't have a voice, your machines, right? Mm. So they can't tell you, oh, you I got a problem, right? You yeah. need to know they got a problem. Or there's a bad actor in here. You're like, a database doesn't be, oh man, I don't know this guy. <laughs> exactly. So it's like, it's all automated. How do you figure out whether they're still intact? Do they still have the right certificate on it? Is the lifetime of that machine still valid, right? All of those, what we call really the life cycle management of an identity it doesn't matter whether it's a machine or a person, but it's how do you get that under control is really at the core of a lot of those things, basically. You know, when you were describing all that stuff, I don't know why, but I kept picturing my mind Mission Impossible and how Tom Cruise always has to access something with like the most advanced <laughs> security, you know, like, oh, it measures how you walk. I mean, that's obviously a movie. Yeah. At the same time, I'm thinking to myself, I don't know how far-fetched that is. Will we get to the point? What are some of the things you see in the future that will exist up the levels of security because i think that's the number one fear people have which is the more seamless the experience we feel like the easier it is to hack do you know what i mean like because it's a seamless experience because a lot of people worried now let's go but you take my phone then you can access everything so for the people that are late adopters especially late adopters who don't want to put their credit cards on their phone they don't want to do mobile pay they don't want to you know, they don't want to do certain things yeah. because they typically in their mindset have this fear like, oh, okay, well, if it's easy to use, it's easy to break. I would disagree. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> and for a very simple reason, what is easy to use? Like a bank transaction that you had to fill out the paper, sign, and then <laughs> give it to somebody. How easy is that to forge compared to somebody needs to steal your phone, install some rigid app, right? Then replace something, get your password, understand all of the details. The level of complexity is different. Now, for a one-time event, when somebody tries to steal $50, well, going to your grandma and just taking 50 bucks by a bank transaction that you had on paper yeah. was easy, right? Now, I think the threat really comes in because now with all being digital, it gets much more important for groups who want to make a lot of money and do that on a mass market and try to hack lots of devices or block companies from doing so. I think there's a few concepts of security and, let's say, protection that need to be obeyed. And as long as you look out for those, my answer would always be what we do today and what we will do in the future will always be much more secure than anything that you'd had up till now. That's the quick answer. The more complex answer is, if you think about it, there's always things that run in the back that people don't know about. So what people don't know is already a barrier, right? Yeah. Think about a museum and you want to steal something and you don't know that there are sensors on the floor and the ceiling <laughs> and whatever. If you don't know where the sensors are, it becomes much more complicated than if you would know, right? Yeah. So it's the same concept here. It's like, if you know what's happening, then you know how to possibly tweak it. So coming back to what I said at the very beginning, everything that's kind of invisible is already a good protection. But the second piece I would say is, is like a lot of people in the consumer space make money by knowing what you're doing and how you're doing things. That's not the intent of companies or banks to some extent. Yes, they want to know where you put your money and for what reason for, like, say, making sure they understand what happened, right? If in case something goes wrong and for audit purposes, but they don't care about it. So as long as you try to work with something that, you know, doesn't have your real data on it. So like you're tokenized, basically, you never know that it was Albert who did the transaction, but it was x 17915 h 7 whatever, and then runs through one transaction and they forget about all the data that they have. If that isn't there, 
then nobody can steal that data from a get-go. Yeah, they might get your name and they might get your birth date or something if they're really, really into it. But then there is nothing else on top. So it's, it's a concept of what data do you need to store, which is very well regulated today, depending on what industry you go in, which is very little regulated when it comes to consumer side of the house, right? Particular, like say, if you just use your login for any website that you find, whatever, it's like yeah. what they collect is in the cookies, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but for companies, it's like, they don't want to own the data. Yeah, they don't. Yeah. They really don't because <laughs> the more they own, the more reliable they need to be, the more they're on the spot for being able to do something. So our concept, our logic is always kind of don't collect anything that you don't want in the first place and use it only for the time until you don't need it anymore and then forget about it, right? Easiest thing to do. There you go, Martin. I appreciate that, that little talk on that because I'm speaking directly to all the old school business operators who are scared to move forward with mobile simplified systems. They get scared. They get scared. <laughs> like they see simple to use. They think, oh, that easy to hack. Not true. I like how you said every day is a little bit more secure than the day before. Yeah. Don't be scared. Martin, I want to thank you for joining us today on IT Visionaries. But before you go, it is now time for the lightning round. The Lightning Round is brought to you by Salesforce Platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Martin, this is where we ask you questions outside of work so that our audience can get to know you better. Sure. Fire away. All right. Right out the gate, where do you currently reside? I'm in Austria, EMEA. Beautiful. Summer's about to start. Um, so pretty happy over here. Looking forward to be able to travel somewhere else again soon. <laughs> yeah, your LinkedIn profile says you've bounced around quite a bit. Uh, I, you know, prior to the pandemic, how much traveling did you do for work and for just, you know, just the joy of traveling? The good thing is, I think, you know, um, traveling for work and traveling for um, private purposes needs to kind of come together. Then it's always the best <laughs> thing. So I, I like to be around. So yeah, I would say I'm typically, I don't know, 50, 60% on a plane or something like that. Wow. Yeah, but it's like, you know, you have teams in the US, you have people in EMEA, you have customers in APAC, then, you know, it's a good thing because it's diverse and you learn a lot of things from different cultures and different people. I, I like to travel a lot. There you go. What is the most secure culture, you would say, secure by attitude culture that you've been around? When you say secure culture, you mean like people being secure about what they do or being secure, like what, what you mean? You can interpret it any way you want. It's an open-ended question. I, I, I was trying to think of it as we were talking to you. I said, you know, when I was in Singapore, everything seemed to be high tech in like with security, like it was badges, access for everything. And then I also thought I was the most safe. I felt probably safer than I've ever felt in any place in Singapore, but that was just me. Yeah, so I would tend to agree that um, Korea, Singapore are good places from technology point of view. I would also say that Japan, in, the first thing that jumped to my mind is when you said secure, is like, well, they try to stay with, within a certain area and then, but they're super high tech and everything is rock solid what they do. But on the other side, it's like when you talk about, it really is a thing. If you talk about industry standards on certain areas, Europe is pretty big, particular, like say Germany, for example, when it comes to security and things like that, they are kind of the mastermind behind a lot of things. But I, I think, you know, obviously, as you asked me before, I feel pretty secure being in Austria as well, because to go or do whatever you want, there is never, ever an issue about it at all. So <laughs> pick your choice. So give us an idea for those of us that love traveling and can't wait to travel again. What would it be like? Give us a perfect day in Austria. If I were to go to Austria and I only get one day, tell me the things I have to do. I'll give you two answers because the answer is different whether it's summer or winter, right? <laughs> okay, okay. It's about to be summer, so let's go with summer first. Okay, on summer, I, I think if you only have one day, you need to make a choice. Either you want to figure out the truly benefit of coming to a country. It's, by the way, Vienna is the most livable town on the planet. We overtook Vancouver just recently. So that's actually pretty exciting. And it has all the old, you know, castles and it's been there forever. And so it's kind of good vibe and it's a good city. Austria, however, is famous for its mountains, right? So if you're anywhere in outdoors, I'd recommend you go to the mountains. You take a few climbs on the hills and walk through the valleys and, 
and the mountains. It's, it's just beautiful. On a nice day, you know, you have a broad view of all the Alps and it's just, you'll remember and you're going to love it, right? So that's the summer. That's the summer recommendation I would do. There you go. So if, if that's for everybody, if you are a city dweller, Vienna, Martin says that's the place to go. And if you're an outdoors person, you want to go hiking or something like that, hit the mountains. It sounds like it's absolutely amazing. That's actually true. And then the mountains translate into winter as well. If you're anywhere on skiing, that's what you do in Austria. Like you can't be an Austrian if you didn't grow up with skis on your feet at the age of three, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm assuming you're a skier. Yes, since the age of three. <laughs> so that's why I'm talking about it. Yeah, I, I love skiing. We've, we've been all around all, everywhere. But I have to say, Austria is beautiful. But that's where the US, I would say, beats us. Best place to ever ski, I would say Utah. Yeah? It's pretty decent. <laughs> Sorry for all the people out of Colorado, right? <laughs> hey, listen, I've never been able to ski Utah, but now off that recommendation, if you're a world traveler and you grew up in Austria and you had access to you know, obviously much of the apps. I know that the most thing I'm, I think, jealous of, of growing up in Europe is the access to all the different cultures. It's just a short flight away. Whereas the United States, of course, we're flying state to state, which is, it's the same in price, but not the same in like experience. You know, I, I, you know you're flying to a brand new country, but if you're giving the recommendation that Utah is the place to ski, that says a lot about the Utah mountains. Well, yeah, it's the altitude, obviously, and then the snow and if there's powder. We don't have the altitude here, so it's unbeatable, at least for an Austrian guy. <laughs> <laughs> Might be different. When it comes to after skiing, I think Austria would beat you, but that's a different story. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there we go. Martin, I want to say thank you for joining us today on IT Visionaries. Thanks for sharing a little bit about your career, the future of access management, some of the things you're working on, and for us world travelers that can't wait to start traveling again, like you said, the city, Vienna, if you like the outdoors, hit the mountains. And if you're just a ski fan, give it a try. But if you want to <laughs> epic skiing, Martin says Utah's the place. <laughs> Martin, thanks for joining us today on IT Visionaries. Thank you, Albert. The pleasure to be here. IT Visionaries is created by the team at mission.org and brought to you by the Salesforce Customer 360 platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Build connected experience, empower every employee, and deliver continuous innovation with the customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com slash platform.